All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Museum of African American History and our first ever Google Connected Classrooms program. We are so excited to be participating in this exciting event. My name is Samantha and I'm here in the Abiel Smith School, one of the historic sites that makes up our museum here on Beacon Hill in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm going to turn it over to Marchi. Hi, I'm Marchi and I'm standing right next door to the building where Samantha is in the African Meeting House. Welcome. Okay, and we have two classrooms joining us from around the country. So I'm going to click to them now. Um, how about Mr. Johnson's class to start us off and introduce yourselves? Just come on up and share. Well, I'm Braxton and Braxton Smith. Smith and <laughs> I go to Southwind. What great? And eighth grade. Where are we located? Oh, yeah. And Iowa. Where? Austin, Iowa. Nice. That was amazing. All right. Good job. Thank you. And how about over at Harry Stone? Hi, I'm Modalis Avila, and I will be introducing eighth grade advanced technology class from Harry Stone Montessori Academy at Dallas, Texas. Did you hear her? It's a little low for us. <laughs> Microphone's right there. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Modalis Avila, and I will be introducing eighth grade advanced technology class from Harry Stone Montessori Academy in Dallas, Texas. All right. Excellent. Thank you. So here we are back at the museum, and while we're introducing ourselves, I wanted to introduce you to this young man. He greets all of our visitors to the exhibit here, and his name is Henry Monroe. Now Henry was only about 13 years old when he joined the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, the first all-black regiment from the North to participate in the Civil War. Now here at the museum, and especially in this exhibit, we're looking not just at Henry's story, but at the thousands of stories of people like him who participated in the struggle for freedom. Now, like any story, we want to start ours at the beginning. And this story is not just one about the Civil War, but as old as our nation itself. So for that, I'm going to go over to Lamurchi at the African Meeting House. Thank you, Samantha. Let's go with Henry to the African Meeting House to figure out why he becomes a soldier at 13 years old in the Civil War. What happens before that, you might ask? Here are the questions that we might have and Henry would have too. Before we get to the African Union House, let's think about how did we even get to America and why? Who were the people who came to America and who did they find already here? Can any of you answer this question? Feel free. Who were the people in America when the people who came here for their freedom, who did they find here? Native Americans? Say no. Native Americans. Native Americans. Oh, that's right. They found the Native Americans. And who were the people? Anybody? Who were the people who were English? The British. 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 Now we have a question again. We know that they arrived around 1619 in, uh, in America, right on the shore on the coast of America. That ship arrived with people from Britain seeking freedom. What kind of freedom? Some of them religious freedom. Some of them looking for a place to survive where they could have rights. To have these rights that they did not have in England, they made a body of laws called the Body of Liberty. That would make sure that they would have these rights as they kept working to secure their survival. Now, in 1638, there came another ship that arrived in Boston Harbor 
called the Desire. On that ship, there were kidnapped Africans who were exchanged for Native Americans in the West Indies. They arrived here in Boston. Now that leads us to a question about liberty. Whose liberty is it? And what happened to liberty? We know that in the body of liberty, men, women, and property and rights to their money, taking care of themselves, land. However, some people did not have rights secured by this body of liberty. These rights were numbered from one to nine. And then number 91 talked about slavery. It is said that there shall be no slavery except that a person sold themselves into slavery or was captured. With that law, Massachusetts became the first colony to have slavery legally in that body of liberty since 1641. Now we ask ourselves, what is it to be enslaved? I'm going to ask you. Are you forced to work without your permission? Did someone ask that? Slavery. No. Are you forced to work without your permission? So if you're a yes. slave. Yes. 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 And are you paid for your labor? No. 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 So is this a fair situation? Right. Okay. So, so from 1641 in Massachusetts to 1783, when slavery ends here, people are still trying to get their freedom, including the enslaved Africans. So there is a woman whose name is Mom Beth, who hears a phrase in the home where she's enslaved and people are writing the Declaration of Independence, all grouped together there, and she's serving them, while she hears a phrase called, all born free and equal. She believes this, and when she's challenged, she runs away from that home, and she asks a lawyer to represent her case in court based on all born free and equal. And she wins. She wins her freedom and she names herself Elizabeth Freeman. That's in 1783. Her case ends slavery legally. But that does not mean that people are not mistreated. In fact, even in Boston, there was unfair treatment because of color. A few years later, or, or earlier, there was a man, his name was Prince Hall, a man of African descent who was serving in a home in Boston, and he was awarded his freedom in 1770. He had a contract that said he would only serve a number of years, and so that enslavement was over for him. He then had his own business in soap making and leather dressing, and he began to understand that we need to organize. He organizes a group of black people who wanted freedom, and so he and other black men decide that as America is fighting for its freedom, they want to fight too. And they become patriots of the American Revolution, soldiers in the war, who want to claim their citizenship and feel that America has to be free for them to do that. And they are called the Bucks of America, led by Colonel George Middleton. After the American Revolution, Prince Hall, that same man, formed a group of black people then that would include not only men, but women and children, and it was called the African Society. They decided that they needed a place to worship, to worship freely, educate their children, and have a place to come where they could talk about ending slavery in all of America. There were people coming to Boston at the time in the harbor from France and Spain and Holland and England and Ireland and Africa, West Indies, 
It was pretty crowded here. So the African society, the African and African American people, decided they wanted their own community and they were going to move from around the Boston Harbor. And so, as they wanted their own community, I want to ask you, what do you think they would need to build a community? Is there anyone from Mr. Smith or Mr. Johnson's class that can answer that? What are the things that you think you need to build a community? They would need people and land and resources. Okay, that's good. And that's good. Don't mute it. Okay, unmute it. And et cetera. And et cetera. Thank you. He's still good. He's still Why did you fail here? Whoops, I think Lamurchi is still muted. <laughs> okay, I heard you say things like people and land and houses. Um, you would all you would definitely need all of those things to build a community. Um, in addition to that, you want to have education for your children, jobs. And you need a place to meet, to gather, to decide what kind of laws you want to live under. So, these things that were decided in society were to build a community and to do that they needed funds. So they began collecting funds to be able to build a building, but they needed to land in order to build that building. And so they brought the land where I'm standing right now to another point where Samantha is in the building next door, and they began to build this building called the African Meeting House in 1806 with their own labor and materials. One of the things I'd like you to do is since we are in the space and you can see the space, I'd like you to look at it and tell me what you think about it. First of all, how old was it? Is there anyone who can answer? It was built in 1806, and we are now in 2014. I know I have some quick mathematicians in the class. How old? Two hundred and eight. Two thousand fourteen. So we know that from eighteen oh six to nineteen oh six, it was a hundred years old. Nineteen oh six to two thousand six, is two hundred years old. And then from two thousand six to two thousand fourteen, is how many years? Uh, somebody said eight. I heard eight. That's good. So we know it. Two hundred and eight. Two hundred and eight. Two hundred and eight years old. I hear all kinds of responses happening. But that doesn't mean you're how late. Many, how many years? One, two, three. Two hundred and eight. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now, what do you think? Looking at this building. What do you think that the people who built it would use it for? It seems about 200 and some people took it. Some ideas of what they would use this for. Look at it. A church. A church. Good. That was one of the, the uses of it. It was the first African Baptist church. And it opened December 6, 1806. What else do you think they might have used it for? Louder. Yes. Very good. The town hall. It was a type of town hall. In fact, they called it the Black Spaniel Hall. Uh, it was nicknamed that because there were meetings here that people could come to who were black, who could not go to other places in Boston 
big, big halls and be admitted. So they come to this house and discuss whatever it was they wanted to. It was also a place for celebrations and dinners and concerts. They celebrated the uh, uh, other nations, other And it mainly was a gathering place where they could hear people speak like Frederick Douglass and others. So the, the people that you will hear about more in the exhibition all were in this space and met here. You can see the wonderful cues and look at the floor. The floor is even older than the building itself because it, it came from another church. The floor is actually 275 years old. So we're very happy that you were able to come into this space with us and know more about its history and its importance because all of this and more were the reasons why people met in this house. They wanted equal citizenship in America. And they wanted to make their own decisions. And they wanted liberty and freedom and to end slavery. So to make sure that, that this would all happen, they wanted to ensure that they would have an education. So right, right where I'm standing, below me on the next level was a school that was actually started in a house near the African Meeting House. In 1797, the African school started in a house. It moved to the building in the floor below me in 1808. After that, as there were at least 200 children in that room, this community decided they wanted to build an actual school building. And so they built the brand new building next door in 1835 that opened called ABL Smith School. And that is where Samantha is waiting for you. All right, so here I am in the ABL Smith School building. It was built in 1835 right next door to the African Meeting House. And it's actually the first public school building in the country built specifically to serve African American children. Today, the Meeting House and the Smith School together make up our museum here in Boston. Um, here at the Smith School, the rooms that were once used as classrooms now house our exhibits, like the one you see around me right now. Now, this exhibit that you, we have on view today is called Freedom Rising. So before we even really dig into it, I'd like all of you to think about that phrase and why we titled the exhibit Freedom Rising. What do you think we mean by that? Maybe by the end you can um, share some of your ideas. So Freedom Rising off opened last year to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 54th Regiment. Um, but the, these events both took place in 1863, now 151 years ago. But we didn't want to tell a story just about 1863. What we wanted to do is go back and look at the work of Boston's black community and abolitionist community, men, women, and children, and their role in bringing about these momentous events of 1863 and this effort, this incredible effort to end slavery in the United States. So before we go any further, I wonder if we could have a volunteer tell us what does it mean to be an abolitionist? I'm going to go to Mr. Johnson's class. Okay, who, who knows? Abolitionist. What? Come on up. Like to Abolishing what? Well, like to remove, I, like remove what? slavery. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> to stop slavery. All right. So thank you very much. So yeah, that first root of the word abolitionist is to abolish, and so the abolitionist movement um, is the name given to all of the people who worked together to abolish to get rid of slavery. Now, one of the things that we really wanted to show in this exhibit is that there's no one way to be an abolitionist. Um, part of what made the movement so strong is that people worked, many different people worked in a 
use many different strategies to pursue this goal. So what we're going to do is move to a different part of the exhibit now and meet some of those people who are key figures in this Boston abolitionist community. So here we go. <laughs> Okay, so here we are in the part of the exhibit where we really dig into the abolitionist movement and meet some of the people who are part of this movement here in Boston. So, to start off, let's look at this gentleman. His name is William Cooper Nell. He was actually born and raised here in this Beacon Hill neighborhood to a free black family. His father actually fought in the American Revolution. When Nell was a child, he attended the school in the lower level of the meeting house that Lemurchie mentioned earlier. And when he grew up, one of his jobs was working on an anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. Now, that newspaper had been established by this gentleman. His name was William Lloyd Garrison, and he was a white abolitionist. And in addition to founding The Liberator, he also established a very powerful interracial abolitionist organization um, called the New England Anti-Slavery Society, which eventually became the American Anti-Slavery Society. They actually also held their first meeting right next door at the African Meeting House. Uh, one of the things that the society did was invite abolitionists from around the country to come to Boston and join them. Now, one of the people that they invited was... Uh, this gentleman. So his name is Lewis Hayden. Now Hayden has a really different background than Garrison and Nell, who we've met already. Hayden was born into slavery and enslaved well into his adult life. He escaped via the Underground Railroad and soon made a name for himself as an abolitionist. Now Garrison, here, here behind me, and, uh, and other Bostonians invited Hayden to come and join them. So once he was here, he began working as an anti-slavery speaker, and then he also operated a clothing store and a boarding house out of his home, which is still standing here on Beacon Hill. Uh, he also used his home as a staff on the Underground Railroad. Now another anti-slavery speaker who worked in many of the same ways with as Hayden and the other figures we've talked about was... <laughs> Let's move down a little bit more. All right. Now, this guy, his name is Charles Lennox Ramond, and he was an anti-slavery speaker just like Lewis Hayden, but came, again, from a very different background. He was from one of the strongest and, uh, black families in New England. Now, in addition to Charles's work as an abolitionist speaker, his sisters were abolitionists too. His sisters Sarah and Caroline were both very active in the movement. Sarah, for example, staged a sit-in at a Boston theater to protest segregated seating. Um, and she did this in 1853. Caroline, on the other hand, was very involved in the Salem, anti -Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society. Now, Salem had that organization, but Boston had one too. So let's back this up and see if we can meet some of these Boston ladies. Okay, so this might be hard I know for some of you to make out, but this figure here actually shows seven different women who are part of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, so it's important to remember that women were a powerful part of this movement too. Um, and this was before this was a time before it was popular for women to have such public roles as speakers and as fundraisers. In fact, some of the earliest abolitionist women were also some of the first women's rights activists uh, in the 19th century. So that's one way that we think of freedom is rising in all different directions, um, all at the same time. Now, the last person I want to highlight is a little bit further down this wall. So we're going to have to move the computer again. Okay. 
Now, I'm sure that this is pretty hard to see on your screens in your classrooms. The reason why this photograph of this gentleman is so small is it's actually an example of a really popular 19th century photograph called a carte de visite, which is uh, another way to call it a visiting card. So they're actually popular because they were kind of wallet-sized photographs that you could give out to your family and friends. Now, the person pictured in this image, his name was Charles Sumner. And he, we have a, a larger image of him that we can work with so you can actually see him. So here's Charles. Now, he grew up in the same Beacon Hill neighborhood that William Nell did, that first figure that we looked at down earlier on the wall. And he ended up being a lawyer and eventually a senator for the state of Massachusetts. And he became one of the strongest anti-slavery voices in the Senate. Now, that's a lot of information in just a few minutes and a lot of figures that might be new to you. And that's fine. But part, just think of what we just, uh, just learned just from these six different examples of abolitionists. From this sample alone, we see that the movement consisted of both men and women, that there were African American and white members, um, that they came from really diverse backgrounds and life experiences, as diverse as a first-hand experience of slavery and a fairly privileged upbringing in Beacon Hill. And they worked in a lot of different ways. So again, just from these people that we've met here, we've seen uh, public speakers, journalists, politicians, a lawyer, an uh, underground railroad conductor, and fundraisers. Um, and that's just a taste of how diverse and multifaceted this movement was. Now, one question you might have is, so where did they go? How did, how did they accomplish this goal? How did they go about this movement, and why did it take so long? So I'm going to go back to Lamurchie to walk us through that last piece of this story. Hold on, Lamert, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I pressed the other button for mute, and it shows me muted. Unmute. Okay, so, sorry for that technical difficulty, but even with all these people and their incredible talent, ending slavery was no easy task. Uh, in fact, the actual meeting house here served as a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was an Underground Railroad station. Uh, and the people who were here in Boston helped to protect and keep other people safe in this house as they found jobs and employment and places to be in houses around the community that were safe. They worked for decades and decades to pursue the goal of being safe and being free. Meanwhile, the country tried to carefully maintain the balance between the free states in the north and the states that still had slavery in the south. But it was only a temporary fix. Eventually, the nation split apart over the issue of slavery and went to war against itself. And therefore, we had the Civil War. For the first two years, black men were not allowed to enlist in the Union Army even though this was a final chance to end slavery. It was very trying, but community members here in Boston and elsewhere continued to push for their right to fight. In fact, they had meetings right here in the African Meeting House to push for the recruitment of black troops. Finally, in 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation granting freedom to over three million people enslaved in the South. That was a turning point in the meaning of freedom all by itself. But it also opened the door for black men to finally join the army. 
Massachusetts was the first state to raise an all-black regiment. And a lot of that recruitment happened right here in the African meeting house. They were called this troop, the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. Okay, so here we are back right where we started with Henry Monroe. He was one of thousands of men and boys that rushed to Boston to enlist in the Massachusetts 54th once it was finally approved. Um, they came from all over the country. So let's end with some questions to keep us thinking. So looking at this image of this young boy, Henry Monroe, I wonder, why did Henry sign up? Why was this important for him to participate? I wonder what his parents thought about him enlisting in the Massachusetts 54th. And I wonder, what was Henry maybe thinking when this photograph was taken? Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of those questions, but I'd also love to hear your questions for us. So I know we have two classrooms here in the Hangout with us, and some watching um, using the Q&A app. So let's turn it over to you guys. Um, perhaps Mr. Smith's class first. Ask a question. <laughs> no. Oh. Huh? <laughs> oh, that. Go ahead. Um, in place of the house, why were your pants on the ground? I couldn't quite hear that. Look louder. At the meeting place on the ground, why are there vents? At the meeting place, why are there vents on the ground? Oh, vents. Oh, those are put in. Those were put in very recently, certainly not 200 years ago. But we have to heat the African meeting house to keep everything going in it and to be comfortable present day. We use the African meeting house as a, a hall for lectures just as they used it in the 1800s for celebrations, for everything but church. Um, we celebrate marriages and other type of events here. So to make people comfortable in the building, we have to heat the building and we, in the winter, because Boston is very cold, but in the summer we uh, also air condition it. Good question. Go ahead. All right, so I wonder if there are any students from Mr. Johnson's class that have questions for us. Um, I have one. I would like to ask if they would make laws in that uh, building. In the meeting house? Yes. Sure. Um, so I, I can take that one. Um, they wouldn't have passed laws in the building, but they certainly met to discuss laws. Um, so, for example, when Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, this community absolutely came together in the meeting house to discuss their response and their resistance to that law. Uh, Lamarchi, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, there were a number of laws that were uh, prohibiting integration of the schools in Massachusetts. And so one evening in 1849, there was a meeting in this African meeting house called the Meeting of the Great And it was those petitions that this community signed thousands and thousands of signatures to ask the Massachusetts legislature to change the laws about integrating schools. And so from that pressure and another court case on a, a, a girl whose name was Sarah Roberts, um, Massachusetts integrated schools in 1855. So the meetings that were had here did not always result in a law being changed. 
but there, this, the activism of this community and its agency was to make sure that their voices were heard and they would pull their thoughts together here and then approach the Massachusetts legislature to change the laws. Okay, do we have another question from Mr. Smith's class? Yes. Um, are any of the original families that established the community, are some of their descendants still around? Yes. Yes, Absolutely. they are. That's a good uh, so the museum actually works very closely with some of the descendants of the abolitionists that we talk about all the time. So we're close friends with descendants of Charles Sumner, who I mentioned, William Lloyd Garrison, John J. Smith. Um, yes, many. as much as possible, the museum has made an effort to be connected with those descendants and share their stories as well. And in fact, one of the descendants is on a part of the governing board of the museum. So we're very happy that the descendants uh, are around us in the community and there are more people who find out they're related to others who were here in the 1800s who call us, who write us, and ask us if we can help them find out uh, the truth. So that's a very good question. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our program, and I wanted to make sure we took one question from the class that I know is watching um, Miss Hannah's class from uh, Missouri, I think, Ohio. Um, so, yes, so Cameron from Ohio would like to know if there were slaves all over the world or just in the United States, which is an excellent question. And the, the answer is a complicated one. But there is absolutely slavery in elsewhere in the world besides the United States. Slavery is a really old institution, and it's existed in various forms and in many places for thousands of years. So, um, but as we know, the uh, transatlantic slave trade is responsible for the system of slavery that emerged here in the United States. Um, but there was also a slave trade in the Indian Ocean world, for example. Um, an exchange of people between East Africa and uh, the Middle East and India. Um, there was also uh, slavery elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. So not just North America, but Central America, the Caribbean islands, and certainly South America. So there is a very broad international history of slavery. Any last thoughts from any of our participating classes? This is. We have a question. Mr. Johnson's class. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay. So for the meeting house, was that is what we see? Was that the main room, or is there any other like rooms? Uh, this is the main room. This is this is the sacred space um, for church and for other kinds of meetings that were held. It also, after uh, 1899, became a Jewish synagogue. So the room that you're looking at was totally space for gathering in large groups um, for religious purposes and for pur purposes of understanding what was going on in slavery. Downstairs, right underneath this room, was a room that was used for the African school from 1808 to 1835. So there are, there are other uses of the room that have happened like they would have choral concerts and practices and exhibitions of the students and what they were learning in that space uh, below us. They also had a minister's apartment in that space for ministers who were uh, who may not have had a house uh, temporarily until they moved into a permanent house that could use the apartment downstairs. We also know that there was a catering business uh, that was run by a man whose name was Domingo Williams 
And the reason we found out he had his catering business here in the African Meeting House is because archaeologists in 2005 dug into the earth and they found pieces of his china from the 1800s. So our stories for this African Meeting House are many. They had a place to administer medicines. One of the people who was in the exhibition, Dr. John S. Rock, was a doctor who administered uh, right from the African Meeting House. When people were traveling on the Underground Railroad, they had places to come to where they could get help, even with their health. And this was a place like, like that. So we're fortunate to have this meeting house to talk about those real things. And we found medicine bottles also in that 2005 archaeological dig that was held here. So the reason why the museum for us is so important because it gives us fact. It gives us objects. It gives us documents to talk about this history and those stories. Very good question. Thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm going to have to wrap us up, but before I do, I wanted to thank both of our participating classes and all of the students who are both in our hangout here and watching online. Um, this has been a great program, and we hope to host it again. Um, and just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay, very nice. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop our broadcast now. Thanks, everyone.